continuous uh, support and contributions. Um, although I get to stand up here and talk to you for an hour and a half um, about all the work I've been doing behind the scenes, really all of this is also your work. And so when you see all these big graphics that I've had printed up, um, understand that these are your bees um, and all of the data that you've been in the field uh, collecting and contributing. So it's pat yourself on the back every time you see something cool because that was one of your contributions at the time. Question. Your life's just working? You have to use the... No, no, it was, it was just working. Well, literally and figuratively behind the scenes. I mean, I can see you right behind right <laughs> you. There we go. So I've broken this down into about seven parts. It's a pretty long talk. Um, so first I'll cover the bee and plant data. Um, you may have noticed kind of some of these exhibits that we have in the foyer and this giant tree up on the board. So I'll cover these three um, major exhibits here. I'll review the Oregon bee fauna for you, and then we will revisit that and talk about maybe how many bees are actually in the state. Um, I'll talk about all the DNA barcoding work we've done, and then we'll, we'll end with some cool plants to look for. <coughs> Now, you all have been very busy for the last five years, and we have had five collecting seasons now. We're going into our sixth. In 2018, you generated around 18,000 specimens. That's really great. We were off to a really strong start. Um, in 2019, uh, you collected somewhat more than that, pushing well into the 26 or 27,000 uh, specimens collected range. Of course, in 2020, it was a boom for the Atlas, and that's because the weather was great, and you were not allowed to socialize. <laughs> <laughs> and so what did our members do? They went out into the field, and they generated more than 35,000 uh, zoological specimens for the bee Atlas, which was amazing. And I have curated uh, up to and including now the 2020 uh, bees, and so, when you see different data um, presented, um, understand that in most cases that's data up to and including 2020, and it may not include um, 2021, and of course doesn't include 2022 uh, bee taxonomic or plant data in most cases. 2021 was pretty good, but it was definitely a drop off um, from the 2020 collection season, but we still had, you know, in the realm of 30,000 records generated. And of course, this past year was also another great season with you know, 23,576 bees generated, I think, um, having collected them all individually. And of course, you, a lot of you are turning in your collections right now, and those are you know, in a mountain of bee boxes in FOIA here. So all told, um, we've generated somewhere in the neighborhood of 133,000 records in the last five years. Um, a great majority of which have a plant association with them. It's a lot. Um, our interactive module out in the foyer um, is running off this uh, backbone data set of those 133,000 uh, collection events uh, and specimens generated. It's really quite impressive, but if we look at the map, we can see actually that there are gaps so despite this incredible collection effort, you know, places that are far away from where people live, of course, are always undersampled um, comparatively to where our major population centers are. And also maybe even more significantly, where our major collectors are. Because a, a lot of the collection effort comes from um, particular individuals. And so you can see that some of those are in the Dallas uh, around the 
bend area in the southwest, in the valley. So if you're looking for to get off the beaten track as far as the atlas is concerned, we have very, very few records from the Umpqua and from Douglas County. Right here, right? So in the Umpqua, we have very few records. And maybe significantly, parts of the Umpqua are in the known range of Franklin's bumblebee. Here we have the Klamath, very, very undersampled. Um, the few samples that we do get from the Klamath, from Steve Sheehy, Sarah Malaby, uh, Katharina, and others, those specimens um, are really cool all the time. So if Steve and Sarah turn in a couple hundred bees, like all of them are really awesome bees. And we always are finding new state records in this part of the state. Um, over in Harney County, in the Mal here, of course, this is you know eight hours from civilization in the middle of nowhere. Um, and then in parts of the Blue Mountains, which have beautiful flora and bee faunas, and um, in parts of Baker County and around the Wallawas, we also have pretty low collection efforts. So if you want to get out there and, and help fill in the map, these are good locations to target. Uh, but of course, you're going to burn some gas getting there in most cases. Now, here's a spotlight on just the Siskiyous, the southwest of the state, right here. And I just made these points a little bit smaller so you can get a sense of the collection intensity and effort and distribution. So, um, where's Martin? <laughs> Martin, I assume that a lot of these coastal samples are yours um, in Curry County here. Um, and we have, a, you know, so many individuals in Josephine and Jackson doing lots of surveying, finding all sorts of cool stuff. And the Siskiyous themselves we're finding have a really novel bee fauna uh, that really matches the the flora that they have in the southwest. So to take a brief um, review of the floral data, um, of course, all of you are familiar with our iNaturalist project because that's uh, mandatory for documenting your plants. We find that there are over 19,000 observations on our iNat project. And those observations, of course, are samples. Each observation is a, a collection event and on average, those collections are around seven bees on average, which is kind of interesting. We get about seven bees every time you take a photo of a plant. Um, we've documented bees from more than 1,450 species, as you see. But of course, we have the same challenge with floral data as we do with the bee taxonomy in that a lot of these images can't even be identified to a, a plant species level. And so we still have many um, of our records and these observations are still at a higher level of taxonomy, either at the family level, tribal levels, or generic levels. Um, some of these plants, you may need to take a photo of maybe the inside of the corolla to get a definitive species ID. So although it says we have documented these from 1500 or 1455 plant species, it's actually far more than that. It's just that we have trouble getting some of that taxonomic resolution on the plants. And so let's just take a, a brief tour through some of these um, observations. So let's take a look at these plant observations. We can see in the top left, rabbit brush with 400, more than 460 samples taken. That's the plant that we have collected most frequently on. And then as we go down, these are ranked in, in order of the number of observations. And so as we scroll down, um, we find that after about 100 plant species, the remaining plants are actually not that intensively sampled. And so once we get down here a little ways, we start to see that even some common plants like blanket flower, Gilardia aristata, only has 29 samples taken. And so some of these plants are actually of really high interest, um, and we can still use quite a bit more sampling on them to find weird specialist bees or document the the range of some of these things a little more broadly. And so if you just click on that species list and look at our data, it can give you a sense of, of things to look for and where your efforts might have more impact. So that's one way to look at the, the plant data, and there's lots of it. Another way is to look at the observations. So these are all of our samples, and I'm going to search for something I love, which is the penstemons, of course, 
and we can just look at the OVA data for samples on penstemons and for beard tucks. What do we find? There's more than 400 samples from the genus penstemons for the Oregon atlas. And those samples have been taken from what we know are at least 35 species. And of course, we have many other observations on penstemons, but they're only at the generic level. So these are for the species level only. So these are all of the penstemons people in the Oregon Bee, or Bee Atlas have collected from, which is amazing. Um, and so if you're really into penstemons, again, look at the number of observations on those species and you find that most of our penstemons have only one, two, or three samples from them. And of course, um, penstemons that are either common or that I'm looking at all the time, <laughs> uh, things like the hot rock penstemon, penstemon deucis. Um, now these are where those samples of bees taken on penstemon deucis are. And we find that I collected a lot of them down here, but then other people have found them throughout the Blue Mountains and into the Wallawa region in the Northeast. So that's pretty cool. So you can do a deep dive into our plant data in many different ways. And I think I'll leave it at that. Could you give me a heads up on time at about 11? Yeah, and I, I, I've been asked, like, sorry, I gotta, it's gonna be out because people wanna see where you're pointing, but so I gotta. I'm that might make, be difficult. No, but I gotta, I, can, I think I can make you, I'm gonna make you smaller and I can see you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tony. Okay, there we go. Oops, sorry. Is there a good place to stand or can I just like. No, I think there, this this will work here. Okay. Okay, right, and do you want a, a, a time warning at when? 11 a.m. Okay, you got 45 minutes. Great. So our first exhibit is um, the interaction data. And so I'll give you a brief tutorial on how to understand and interpret this information. So as we know, when you're out in the field, you take a picture of a plant with a flower on it. In this case, it's a pink flower. And then you sample your bees and you caught, instead of the usual seven, <coughs> you only caught four bees. And so the data you've created is an interaction between this plant species and these four bee species. Pretty straightforward. Now you go further down the trail, you find a purple plant, and you find three different bees, but also some of the same bees that were visiting that other plant back on the trail. And so you document a few more interactions between these different bee species and plant species. You go down the trail a little farther, and you find a green flower, and you find a few more bees that you didn't find on the initial plants, but you did find some bees that visited the first plants, and so this plant had all of these interactions. And you can see that some of the bees visit more than one plant, some of the bees you've only found on one plant. And you go further down the trail again, and you find an orange flower, and you only see one bee visiting it. So you think, hmm, that's strange. So you go back the next day, and the day after, and the day after, and you keep sampling on that plant. And you sample five days in a row, and you find every day you find one of those bees on that plant, but no other bees. And so maybe this represents a specialized relationship between these two bees. If we look at, say, this bee, the red bee, it's a generalist forager. It collects pollen and nectar, presumably from the pink flower, the purple flower, and the green flower. And so the, this is interaction data, and it forms a network where different players interact with a variety of other individuals. And so when you came in, we have that banner in the foyer. This is our interaction network just for the bumblebee data. And so there was about four flowers and 10 bees in that initial tutorial, and about 20 interactions. Well, through the Oregon Bee Atlas, we've now generated, as of 2020, and including 2020 data, 46,000 interactions. And so what you've created now looks like this, where the bees are, species are on the bottom and the plant species are on the top. And everywhere you see a line, uh oh, that's good. <laughs> it's a big file. Everywhere you see a line, that's indicating one of those interactions. And where you see a thick line, that's indicating where that interaction between that one bee and that plant has been documented maybe 30 or 40 times, um, maybe five times by you, but maybe 10 times by someone else. 
and possibly in different parts of the state and at different times of the year. Now, our network is so big, that's actually only the first half. Um, this is the second half. And so the thing to keep in mind is that each one of these lines, each one of these interactions connecting the bees and the plants is actually your effort. And so if this is you out in the field documenting those bees, visiting those plants, and creating those lines um, between them. And so each one of those lines represents your labor, your effort, your study, and your contribution to the project. And so these really thin lines represent one interaction. So that's one bee that someone caught and documented the flower. Um, let's see. Where's Leah? All right. Can I get Leah and Cassidy and Finn? And let's see, maybe Sarah could help me. And maybe Sandy, could you just come up to the front for a minute? You're just going to stay right there. So this is one of our, this is the interaction, our interaction data uh, exhibit. So Cassidy, stay right there. Maybe come up here another 15 feet. <laughs> <laughs> Can we see it on the screen, please? Hold that right there. Do you want to zoom in across this for our <laughs> online viewers? <laughs> so this is your work. Um, and this is the network to date uh, for the bee atlas. We have about 400 species of bees represented on the bottom, and we have those 1,400-ish plant species on the top. Um, <laughs> and I couldn't find a place to hang this. <laughs> <laughs> so this is all of your work. So seriously, give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> yeah, there's nowhere on earth to put this. Uh, Cassidy, you can start rolling from your end, and then we'll just get it down to about 10 feet or so and put it on the table. And so we also have a network um, up in the foyer, and it's just our network for the bumblebees. So it's only about 22 species of bumblebees that we have data for in the state. Um, and I was able to hang that one up because it's only 22 feet long. Uh, and so it's just up on the wall outside. Wow. That's beautiful. Well. <laughs> well, let's see if we can just like uh, we'll just fold it up for the time being. That's going to work out. <laughs> just throw it down. So I kept joking that this uh, graphic was too large for the earth, the, our earthly plane. <laughs> it's really like when we talk about big data and ecology, this is what we're creating. We're creating something that's too large to actually, you know, project. Is there cool. any other organization that has a chart like that? I don't know. Who works with networks a lot? Do you? I don't know if anyone has one that. No. <laughs> I, I, I think you can get it through. Yeah, so that's cool. So we have another exhibit. The second exhibit is our touchscreen module. Again, that's in the foyer. And so I just wanted to give you an idea of how to interact with it and get you know some entertainment value out of it. Mostly, I just want you to be able to um, project your own personal data on it if you have been collecting for the B Atlas for some time. So what you're going to do is you're going to click on Home to reset the application. Um, the map here shows a chloroplet of how many 
specimens have been generated from each county. The darkest ones are more than 10,000 specimens, and the lightest ones are less than 2,000 specimens for those counties. So this is another way to um, see where you can have the greatest impact. And like the other maps I showed, we find the same gaps, Douglas County, the far parts of the desert. Those are great places to go collecting. And so you're going to click on filters and then your collector filter. You're going to scroll down and find your name. Here we'll click on Julie Biddle and it will display her dots where she's collected all of her samples. And actually the version that's on the touch screen outside will provide um, a summary of the phonology of her collections as well as a head count of her total number of bees. So if you click through each name, you'll find who has the most bees. I don't know who it is at this point. So again, we'll hit home to reset, click on filters, collector filter, and then we'll scroll down. You find your name, click on it, and it'll display all your data for you. And if you zoom in on the dots, you can take a, a closer look at the data for those particular specimens or collection events. So here we have Gretchen Peterson's data. Really amazing coverage on the east side. And if we scroll around, we see um, the basic information for those collections and specimens and collection events. Um, this doesn't have really high resolution on the bee taxonomy uploaded into it. Um, mostly we're trying to get um, just a simple uh, display up for you folks. And it's working pretty good out there. Yes, Pat? Is this online now? It is online. OregonBees.osac.oregonstate.edu. She said that one more time. We'll put it in the roundup. Okay. OregonBees.osac.oregonstate.edu. We'll put it in and the when roundup. When was this updated? Um, so this was updated on Friday. <laughs> so it was updated on the wire, and um, the backbone for this now is all 133,000 records. And so even the 2022 uh, specimen records are displayed on here, but of course, because they're sitting in the hallway there, we don't have names on them all yet. So it's pretty simple, but I think, you know, you get a good thrill out of seeing all your collection effort, especially if you've been in the program for multiple years and gone on crazy trips. Um, so moving on, uh, we'll talk about um, our Oregon bee fauna, which is something that I work on every single day. Now, a taxonomy is often um, kind of a moving target. The names change a lot, things get revised, genera change, but mostly the families are hopefully never going to change. And so we definitely have six families of bees in the state of Oregon. There are only seven families of bees in the world, and the seventh is Australasian, so we're not likely to find it. But anything can happen. So we have six families, the Andrenids, which are our mining bees, the Halictids are sweat bees, the Kalidids are plaster bees, the Melidids are oil collecting bees sometimes, the Megachelids are Leaf cutter bees and mason bees, and of course the aphids are all sorts of different things. We have found 55 genera uh, through the Oregon Bee Atlas so far in the state. Every year I get to show you new genera that have been documented for the first time in the state. Not genera due to science, but genera that we're finding in the state for the first time. Mostly things from California or Nevada. So northern range extensions into Oregon. And so this is the breakdown for the genera we found through the atlas so far. There are a few genera that we still haven't found, and there are also a few that we suspect are probably here that we will find eventually. And of course, we get constant surprises. The big question is how many species are there? This, this is the big question everyone wants to know. How many species of bees are there in Oregon? And well, we don't know exactly because it's a bit of a moving target. Um, and we'll revisit this a bit, late, a bit later. <laughs> so just to, to cover the, the bee fauna, these are the genera of bees in the family Andrenidae. The mining bees, tattooed mining bees, 
fairy goblin bees, fairy bees, and little black things. <laughs> uh, we have found all of these except for Macrotera or Macrotera, and that is the fairy goblin bee. What a cool bee. There is one record for this bee from Warm Springs from decades ago. It's a known specialist on Scarlet Globe Mallow, and you could be the one to rediscover it this summer, possibly. Um, and what better a name than fairy goblin bee? It's, it's the best one. And it's closely related to fairy bees, and you can distinguish them by a special groove in the tooth. <laughs> yeah. um, in the family Calididae, we just have two genera. That's not going to change. We have Calides, uh, which are the fuzzy ones, and Hylaeus, which are the little black waspy ones. And they both line their nests with a cellophane type uh, material. Calides are mostly floral specialists and Hylaeus are a bit of a taxonomic quagmire um, with a lot of closely related species where the females are especially difficult to distinguish. So we're going to in a sequence a bunch of them. That should help sort things out a little bit. Now within the sweat bee family, the Holictidae, we have several genera. Um, we found a bunch of them. We have not found Dionomia. But Dionomia are usually large bees, they love sunflowers, and you might expect to find those somewhere in the southeast of the state. So these are things known from uh, Nevada. If you get down into Harney or Malheur and do uh, a lot of sampling on sunflowers, you could find a big dark colored Dionomia out there and find a new genus record for the state, which would be cool. Um, this past year, in 2019, we discovered Microlictoides, and I thought this was a brand new uh, generic record for the state, but as it turns out, there is a record on Bug Guide from five years ago or so. And so a year or two after, uh, Harmon found that Bug Guide record at Rough and Ready down by Selma. Um, some of our Oregon Bee Atlas members, including Judy Maxwell, Syacaline, and maybe Gina Shore, Jane Carlson, that crew, um, they found the same bee on the same flower at the same exact site. And so it gives you a pretty good sense of the coverage of our sampling effort, that we can find something that's relatively rare or quite rare, um, and be able to replicate independently that discovery, which is pretty cool. So Michael Lictoides, our rofatines like Dephoria, they're all floral specialists, and our microlictoides is a tiny little thing that's specialized on California poppy. Whoa. And what a weird thing to be specialized on because California poppies don't have nectar. And so although they're a specialist at collecting the pollen from the poppies, of course, they're obligated to seek nectar elsewhere. And so that's kind of cool. Um, and that relationship actually is not that uncommon. So as I've discovered, there are many poppy specialists in the Southwest where we have much higher poppy um, richness. And um, we have another poppy specialist, the Caliopsis obscurella, that's known from the east side from about Bend to south to the border of California. And it's another California poppy specialist. So that's interesting. Now we still have this outstanding question of whether or not the Agochlorine tribe exists in Oregon. Um, and so far it doesn't. Um, I haven't seen any uh, legitimate records or specimens. Um, but there are Agochlorines in the northwest of California. And so it's possible that if you are Martin <laughs> in, in Curry County, you might one day come across a, a small, brilliantly metallic green bee and um, add another genus um, to our state fauna, which would be cool. And it's gonna have a really limited distribution, that's for sure. Now, within the family Melitidae, we just have one genus so far, um, Hesperapus, um, and only one specimen in the one species, that's Hesperapus carinata, which is maybe the most common widespread Hesperapus species. It's specialized on sunflowers, and one specimen was collected out at Farewell Bend on the Snake River. And there's lots of weedy um, annual sunflowers in that area. Um, we think maybe Macropus exists in Oregon. We have the host plant for it, which is a yellow loosestrife, especially Lysimachia ciliata, 
which Macropus really likes. And so the lower Columbia and tributaries have populations of the host plant. And so it's possible you might be able to find um, this really fascinating bee and add it to our state fauna. The closest records would be from the Yakima. <laughs> oh, here's Washington. Yeah, there you go. So the, the, the closest records for us for the genus Macropus would be from something like 1892 uh, from the Yakima or um, recent records from what we consider the lower Columbia in Canada, which is north of Washington state, where we found um, actually some large populations of Macropus um, on the Columbia and uh, Ponderay River Valley. So if you're in Portland, this is a super cool discovery you could potentially make like in the city, in a riparian area or in a wetland. All sorts of things hiding out there. So the family Megachelidae, these are leaf cutter bees, broadly and kin. Uh, there's many genera. We have had some recent discoveries such as Pseudoamphidium. This is an old world genus that's been introduced. And so these occur now in the Port greater Portland area and they are um, spreading southward, specialized on cardoons, Drusula martichoke especially, but probably thistles broadly, I'm guessing. Um, and we have one genus, Lithergopsis, that we think may occur in the state, but has never been documented. Lithergopsis looks like a leafcutter bee, a megachile, um, but they're often specialized on asters or cacti. And so you may find one of these things probably somewhere dry out in the desert, is my best guess. Moving on to the family Apidae. Again, family Apidae has so many genera, um, but a few of interest are the Eucera, which we've had Ellen Watrous. Is Ellen here? She's online. She's not oh, here. Ellen's online. So Ellen um, graciously identified all of the Oregon Bee Atlas Eucera. She did a really excellent um, professional job. And so I'll, I'll talk about the Eucera a little bit more in a few minutes. Um, but we've had also a recent discovery of Xenoglossodes, also known as Xeno what? Or Xeno huh? <laughs> um, and that's thanks to the Willamette University crew with uh, Dr. Professor Brianna Lind, Woo! Ryan. <laughs> What's your full name, Ryan? Strobel and? Uh, Lorena. And? Grace. And Grace. So good job. Ray has been um, leading us on some of our userines, especially Melisodes, and so we had had um, these dark Melisodes that had come from the valley that I had been eyeballing for a while. It's like, oh, it looks like, like something cool. And then Brianna barcoded some along with a bunch of our Melisodes, and sure enough, she got a hit on Tetraloniella. So if, we'll talk about that a little more in a few minutes, but here's all of our usera data that was generated um, by Ellen Watra. So this is pretty cool. So Eucera and this subgenus Simcolonia, which are spring longhorn bees, um, a female pictured here by David Capert, and a male pictured here by Dan Fitzgerald. And you can see these really long antennae. Now Ellen managed to identify over 900 Eucera specimens for us, including dissecting the male apical bits um, in order to identify them to species. And this is what we found. So I know some of you are new to the program. Um, during this presentation, you're going to get hit with a lot of terminology that's going to go right over your head. Like, I don't know what a synhalonia is, and that's fine. So for those of you that are new, you just want to look at the cool picture and the map. Um, for those of you that know what this is, it's like, okay, you're just going to take notes and memorize all these things. Um, but, but really the takeaway for a lot of these species maps is just to get a sense of um, some of the species that are really restricted in their range. And then also just conversely, those species that are widely distributed. And it just gives you a sense of maybe what their niche is, just based on geography. And then I'll just provide you with some commentary on other things that we know about. So in the case of Eucera acerba, <laughs> this bee is specialized on manzanitas. 
It has a Velcro tongue to help get the pollen out of that little bell flower of those Arctostaphylos. And its distribution is pretty distinct. Um, we found a bunch in Deschutes County over in Lane and in the Southwest. However, we know that manzanitas are widespread in Western Oregon. And I would, and I would bet that they're starting to bloom really soon, if not already. And so it's likely that this bee is much more widespread in Western Oregon. It's just that in our centers of high intensity surveying is where we've documented them first. But if you go out and look on manzanitas, you'll often find Eusera, and I bet you will frequently also find this particular species. Now there's at least 12 species of Eusera uh, documented through our project for the state. Actuosa is a small one, it's pretty widespread. Um, Amsinchiae is specialized on Amsinchia, or fiddle, fiddle neck. Um, it's known from the mouth of the Deschutes and also from the John Day, um, but certainly in this region it's more widespread. I have looked for this bee but not found it in other parts of the state, but we know that there are a lot of uh, weedy Amsinchia around, and so it's worth looking to further elucidate where we might find this little orange flower looking thing. Now, Cordley Eye and Edwardsy Eye, look at how well their distributions overlap. And in fact, a lot of sites have produced both species. These are very, by far, the most common two species. Um, they look very similar. One is slightly darker, one is slightly lighter. Um, they visit lots of different plants. Freighter, also common and widespread, but it looks like more montane uh, than high desert, which is kind of cool. Uh, Fulvitarsis has a strange distribution. Um, this is a bee I just know from the far north of Canada, and so it's interesting that we're finding it a few times um, widely distributed uh, in the desert, so we don't know much about it. Curdy, I think, is only known from one or a few specimens collected down in the Cascade Sisku National Monument. Um, there's a, it's a rare bee, there's no photos of it online, and so we just have the April Sternites from Timberlake to entertain us. <laughs> <laughs> Lunata is a pretty cool bee. I think August has been observing this one for a while, um, and you suspect that maybe it loves Indian plum, Hemolaria. I don't know, I don't think it's a specialist, but it does come out at the same time, yeah. It's got a good phenology of that species, perhaps. And we have, you know, a handful of specimens uh, from the Southwest um, and the Coast Range, and probably one from Scott's house, I'm not sure. In Lake County. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> so um, we have this one giant Eusera specimen um, from the high desert. Um, the Lachlan's found. I think it's Speciosa. Um, that's the best match using the key and the descriptions. However, I'm not 100% sure, so we'll, we'll find out eventually. But these things have also turned up uh, more recently in additional trapping that we did in the Albert Desert. So this is definitely like a, de a huge desert usura, um, and we'll see what we'll see what it turns out to be. Finally, we have Venusca in the southwest and a more widely distributed Vergata. And these things are just not commonly documented. And some of these were new records for the state um, that Ellen was able to generate. And so that's super cool to have, be able to put a bunch of dots on the map for a species that we didn't even know occurred here before. And of course, what we don't see in these maps is all of that floral data. And so in the future, we'll figure out ways to create a graphical presentation uh, for the flowers for each species, right? So we have those big networks with all the lines. We're gonna find out, figure out a way to, to uh, demonstrate those floral, uh, the floral data for all these different species. And you'll be able to really quickly see if they're, uh, you know, restricted to a particular family or genus of plants. So that's Eusera. Now, thanks to Brianna, her hard work and others at Lamb at U. Um, when I was visiting, I don't know, six weeks ago or so, um, 
picking up some Melisodi specimen. She's like, oh, I got a hit for Tetraloniella. I was like, oh, that's what that thing is. I was, I was excited because I had eyeballed that bee before, thinking, oh, that's something weird. And sure enough, she got a hit on her DNA for Tetraloniella. Now, this is one of those stories of the moving target of taxonomy, of course, because it's Tetralonia no more. Tetralonia no more. What happened was this paper was published in around 2018 or so, and what they determined through a molecular and morphological revision of a higher classification of the eucerines, the longhorn bees, was that most of our things like squash bees and others were actually subgenera of eucera and not their own legitimate genera themselves, so we've lost some genera. Epinapus is now Eucera epinapus prunosa, for example, and that's our squash bee. And what we thought was Petroloniella um, was determined to be different from the old world Petroloniella. So they were separated. Because Petroloniella was named in the old world first, they got to keep the name, which means that we had to use an older name from the new world for what was Petroloniella. And so that name is Xenoglossodi, <laughs> right? Totally makes sense, super straightforward. <laughs> Taxonomy's amazing, <laughs> it's like black magic. Right. Yeah. Uh, Felipe's paper will be coming out in a couple of months and all that's gonna change again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah, these shrines are a mess. So when we're trying to nail down a, a state fauna, you see the challenge that even the generic names bounce up and down, side to side. Um, and so these are really moving targets. A, a fauna is not static in any way, and of course everything within it is always evolving. So uh, really we're just trying to take a snapshot and present things as best we can. So that said, um, our, xeno, our maybe Xenoglossodes specimen can be ID using the Tetraloniella key, which is a really nice key. So I ran our specimens through it, looked at the male genitalia, and what I found was that the male ape-level sternites um, very closely matched those of Tetraloniella pomine, which is a species known from California, which is a tarweed specialist, Mattia specialist. Um, however, our, our bees are significantly different um, from Pomene. Pomene is a very light colored species. Ours are distinctly very dark and the male genitalia were very close to the diagrams but not exactly the same. There's a couple significant differences. So maybe we have a dark version of Pomene or maybe we just have a new species that's restricted potentially to the Willamette Valley. Yes, David. So, for example, is that where barcoding would come in or how would you? Absolutely. So Brianna has uh, generated barcodes for these already. So what we need to do is go down to California, get a permit, collect some pomene from around where it was originally discovered, and then barcode those and compare them and compare some male specimens. And that's right, exactly. Figure out whether this is just a dark pomene that's in Western Oregon or it's a, you know, Xenoglossodes lomatiae or something. <laughs> or auction off an ape to the high spitter, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> so what I did when I realized, oh, that, you know, this is a cool bee, is I went on to iNaturalist, I looked up Tetralomiella pomene, and what did I find up in the corner of the Willamette Valley in Oregon was a record for that bee. And how could that, you know, how could that be? And so I, you know, I'm checking out this record, and oh, who do I see in the little icon as the collector? And that's our former <laughs> label czar, <laughs> Miranda. And so she has actually already documented this bee on iNaturalist, um, I think unknowingly, really. And um, so these are her photos. So we do have some other evidence of these bees being documented. This, is, this will be the third location that the bees have been found in in Oregon. Um, these are cell phone pictures. And so this is. You can see the, the scutum and the scutellum are all dark hairs on this. Um, and so we can contrast those to specimens from California. Here's a male, and these are eucerines, they're longhorn bees. They look like eucera, but they come out late in the season, right? So one way to tell eucera and melisodes apart is melisodes are usually summer bees, and melisodes are usually summer bees, and eucera are usually spring bees. However, these are eucera looking bees that are out later in the season, so I can tip you off. Also, they're definitely Mattia specialists. 
So the individuals that found the first specimens of these, Jerry Paul, Ellen Watrous, Steve, whose surname I can't remember, and the O'Loughlin brothers in Muddy Valley and Yam Hill, um, I can't remember where it's going with that, but um, oh, they all collected them off of Mattia. And so the Californian species is a Mattia specialist, and so is ours. So here's the Californian species. It's very light, it's a beautiful little critter. Um, some distinct dark patches, however, on our species, it's much, much darker B overall. So very cool. And of course, this presents a great potential study target for this field season for all of our Oregon bee collectors that you can go out in the middle of summer, find some Mattia, which is common in lots of the western part of the state, um, especially any of these species of Mattia, because we have multiple um, tarweeds, several tarweeds in the state. Um, some of them are tall and quite showy, but we do have like this, but we do have some like little diminutive native Mattia. Yes, sir. Has it only been caught off of Elegon so far? Pardon? Has it only been caught off of Elegon so far? Oh, probably, I think, yeah. That would be what I would target, but yeah. yeah. But if you're like in the Klamath, maybe somewhere drier where Elegans doesn't grow, you might find it. some of these little tiny Mattias. And of course, they're called tarweeds because they're covered in these glandular trichomes, these little uh, resiny uh, glands. Calyx here. So some of these uh, Mattia are a little more diminutive than our common um, large ones. <laughs> Finally, um, so that's all of our families, and this is our Oregon uh, Bombus fauna uh, by my estimation. So there are some species we could potentially list on here, but I have eradicated them. <laughs> I've, re I've removed Bombus terricola from the state fauna, just in my own estimation. You know, um, Occidentalis used to be considered a subspecies of terricola, so it's likely that all of the historical records for terricola in Oregon are Bombus terricola occidentalis, which is now its own species, so we don't need to include terricola, which is a transboreal species that occurs much, much farther north. You barely probably get any terricola. In Washington, if ever, I would be surprised. Um, I have removed both Bombus bohemicus and Sucklii. I haven't seen any specimens. Maybe some exist somewhere, um, but if it did once occur here, you know, if we find one, I'll add it back in. But um, again, these are mostly transboreal species that are extremely uncommon um, this far southwest. Also, I've removed Bombus pennsylvanicus, which I think has a dubious record from over like Baker County area, historical record. Um, but I haven't seen any specimens. I think it's you know significantly outside of its range, and it's not likely that we're going to find any. And it is likely that any specimen that was identified as pennsylvanicus was probably a firmidus. So it's probably a misidentification. Now that said, of course, um, Bombus franklini definitely once occurred in the state. It hasn't been seen since 2006, and we have an annual survey for them on Mount Ashland, led by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which is a public event. You can come up there and chase bumblebees on the mountaintop with us. Um, we haven't found any, but we keep looking. And also, we do have a new bumblebee that has been added to our fauna, and that's Bombus impatiens. The eastern bumblebee is an introduced species in the west, introduced into the Vancouver and Northwest Washington area. Uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, not Vancouver, Washington, sorry. Uh, so into the northwest of the US. Um, and Pam Hayes, where's Pam? At Pam Hayes, so Pam found one specimen a worker of Bombus impatiens on Long Beach, visiting one of our most beloved Oregon bee outs, flowers, Hypocaris radicata, the invasive <laughs> hawkweed. <laughs> um, so, you know, collecting on hawkweed, and sure enough, we get the first um, confirmed observation of a newly invasive bumblebee species, and one that has been potentially a smoking gun um, that people think perhaps it's um, introduced disease into Western bumblebee populations and may be partly responsible for 
bumblebee um, species abundance decline in the West. So um, even collecting off of an invasive hawkweed, you find an important record. And so um, the ODA has been following up with additional surveys in that area to see if there's still populations around. And um, so far, I don't think they've gotten any hits. So, so far, just like one worker, where it came from, we don't know. Moving on. So DNA barcoding, I'm going to give you a brief tutorial, just so for some of you, this might be quite technical. Um, let me see how you do. <laughs> So, in animal cells, there's two kinds of DNA. There's nuclear DNA in the nucleus of the cell, and there's mitochondrial DNA in the mitochondria of the cell. The mitochondria produces energy. That's where the energy in the cell comes from. So it has its own special DNA. The work we do, DNA barcoding our bees, uses DNA from the mitochondrial DNA, not the nuclear DNA. And part of the reason for that is that mitochondrial DNA doesn't evolve very fast. That DNA encodes for metabolic genes in the metabolic cycle. And so those genes don't evolve very quickly, whereas nuclear genes might encode for hair color, eye color, simple things that have a lot of variability. And so by using this little piece of the mitochondrial DNA, we can hopefully use it to identify differences between species at that level. So we don't need to differentiate between individuals. We're, we're interested in using that information as a species identification tool, specifically. If we want to look at population level uh, differences or in differences in individuals, we would use way more DNA and we'd use it from different sources. So our sequences are only 648 base pairs long. That's not a lot of information, really, but it is super useful. So as we know, I am the taxonomic bottleneck. All the bees come through me and then become information somewhere for you to look at. And so part of the problem here is that there are so many bee species, bee genera. Um, the resources are incomplete, out of date, non-existent. Um, there's limitations in our morphological assessment. You know, things like these little tiny Lazarglossum dialectus. Um, are basically identical unless you practice dark arts. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm that's, arts. that's right, yeah. <laughs> we all dabble a little bit. And there's many undescribed species still, and there's lots of genera that just have no modern revisions. And so a lot of the species, historical species concepts, are very muddy to say. Um, we also lack reference collections, and so um, as Karen knows, this is one of our biggest obstacles, is when we start a program like this, Oregon doesn't have a modern reference collection for the hundreds of bee species that occur here. So you actually are not just starting an atlas, you're building up a reference collection from scratch. And that's a huge amount of work. And finally, in a lot of cases, because male and female bees are dimorphic, they look different, we don't have a way necessarily to associate them. So we have all of these challenges in trying to figure our bees out, and this is where the DNA barcoding is able to help us. So our process is simply that I select certain bee specimens, um, one leg is the DNA sample, um, Phineas takes a photo of the bee, uh, we compile a whole bunch of data sheets and then we send all this stuff away where they sequence our bee and upload all the data into a beautiful um, software platform. So this is the bee selection process. Um, this is a, a grid of 96 cells with 95 Andrina specimens here representing all different species. We take a, I take a leg off each bee and I stick it in its own little well in a 96 well plate. And we ship that off to the Center for Biodiversity Genomics at the University of Guelph in Ontario, Canada. Phineas generates all of these images. And so far we've DNA barcoded around, I think around 1,600 specimens. And so Phineas and Cody Fewerborn, who worked with us previously, have imaged all of these bees. And of course, to show you all of them would take another 40 minutes. And so we'll look at them four at a time, but it's still going to take 20 minutes. So we're going to look at them at 16 at a time. Um, and this gives you a sense of the volume of DNA barcoding that we've done so far, but also gives you a good sense of just the 
diversity of the bees in the state fauna. So there's red bees, blue bees, green bees, <laughs> yellow bees, big bees, bald bees, fuzzy bees, and on and on, tattooed bees. You get the idea. Bees who climb on rocks. That's right. <laughs> Drop nesting bees, tree nesting bees, sand bees, sand dune bees, and on and on and on. And so this really, really gives you a sense of our DNA barcoding effort to date. Wow. How do you lot. decide which ones you're going to send? Just the ones you're uncertain of what they are, or everything? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have targeted particular genera to start. And so some genera of bees are well known, you can identify all the species. The bumblebees, although they're not easy, the species are fairly well resolved. Um, and so I don't need to focus on those too much. Um, Lazu glossum was our first big push because we know there's probably almost 100 species in that genus in the state. And we knew going in that 80 of them we're going to be like impossible to identify without generating an authoritative reference collection, at least supported by genetic data. And so, where's Joe? Hey, Joe. <laughs> so, so Joe actually selected um, individuals from different Lazuglossum subgenera that he thought represented species groups, and then we took representatives of those, ran them through, and then selected more later after we had had our first, you know, pass of Lazuglossum and so on. I'll talk about Lazuglossum a little bit more coming up. How do you um, make this so that everybody's on the same page after this? Like, are you naming them? Are you giving them numbers? How does somebody in Pennsylvania know what you've done? That's a good question. So really, we just started our barcoding initiative last year. So this is, this is about a year's worth of effort, or a year and a half or so. Um, my goal is to publish some of our sequence data, either with um, manuscripts scripts that we've generated, like Joe's working on a huge manuscript um, discussing three subgenera plus other species we've found. And so we're hoping to publish some of the genetic data, or we're intending to publish some of these barcodes. Um, with our, our other data. So either with um, papers on particular groups or with our, our annual data paper. And so once this is public, then other people can use it. They'll know that those exact bee specimens are in the Oregon State Arthropod Collection. And so they could come and visit um, and, and look at the specimens um, and collaborate in that way. I'd like to add a lot of as well. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Just real quick, do you archive your extractions? Um, they keep them at the University of Guelph, yeah. So I'm going to have to get moving here a little bit, but we have quite a few data sheets that go in. We send it off to Guelph, and they have a great automated facility where their technicians run our plates through all these robots. It's fantastic. And then the if all of the sequences come available online into a, a software program that has built-in analytical tools. And so this is our third exhibit, is the giant bee DNA tree. Um, this is all of our sequences, more or less, to date. Um, and so you can come up at some point and take a closer look. And this is, this is it. And so something to consider is that these long branches indicate differences between species, and these horizontal Groupings represent species groups themselves. So this would be a species separated from the adjacent one. And so this is to give you a sense of how many species, how many sequences we've generated. And of course, at a glance, okay, this is impressive and cool, but you have to take a closer look um, to really get a sense of this. Um, we focus mostly on Andrina, Lazio Blossom, and Osmia. These three genera have many, many species in each one. We've, we've documented more than 75 species of mason bees in the genus Osmia so far. Um, the first pass of looking at Andrina generated around 91 species in the genus. The first pass for Andrina, 91 species. But that's going to provide us with a really valuable reference collection once I put names on all of those. And so for example, this is Andrina. And this is also the family Andrina Day, right? 
These are the polyctidae, the green ones are the megachelidae, and so on. It's color coded on the end there. And these are all the contributors. So these hundred or so people, all you've provided a specimen that had its DNA sequence. So that's kind of cool. You went out, caught a bee, documented the floral relation, all the information, and then ultimately that specimen had a leg pulled off, sent to Canada, and we got DNA sequence from it. So really, those are really high level contributions. Unfortunately, I've uh, been successful in securing a grant to support the production of bumblebee data from the high desert, the sagebrush biome, as well as to um, DNA barcodes, the solitary bee fauna of the sagebrush biome. And so if this is 1,500 or so sequences, uh, my goal is to generate about 2,000 more over the next uh, 24 months and hopefully more like in the next 12 months or so. And so we're going to increase this tree by about 130% coming up pretty quick. <laughs> Not too bad. I see it is kind of flat. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's a lot of images. So, I, <laughs> um, Joe Angler's probably spent a few thousand hours working on the last blossom of the state, um, and so I have. Uh, several slides just to give him uh, the enormous credit he deserves. And so thank you, Joe. <laughs> Around 9,000 lazo blossom specimens identified to at least the subgeneric level and sex, many of which that you'll see um, have gone into this revisionary work uh, on the subgenera Evelaeus, Photogastra, and Hemipolyctus, which are within lazo blossom. Um, these are, this is the distribution for the genus broadly from those 9,000 or so records, and we have about 60 species worked out for Lazio Glossum so far, thanks to Joe's uh, hours on the scope, um, as well as also this barcoding information that they use. So th these are those 60 species. So it's the alphabet of Lazio Glossum. <laughs> Um, it'll be on a test later. <laughs> and so this is pretty good, just to give you an idea of like the scale of these things. This is one genus that we're maybe two thirds of the way through, maybe less. We haven't even touched the dialectus that much really. Um, so, that, <laughs> so this is Lazio blossom through Zephyrus and Zonulum. It's a lot. This is a tree for uh, the genus. So there's, I don't know, a few hundred um, sequences we've gen generated. And this is excluding Leucolictus and Lassiglossum sensostricto, which are the big Lassiglossum that are easier to identify. This is just for all the tiny little Lassiglossum that are driving you mad. Um, so we have around three species of Evelaeus, which are the wide-headed ones, usually. We have Hemicolictus, which are little black things. We have Dialectus, which are little metallic things, and that's Gotagastra, which are other little black things. And Joe has been, you know, um, working on these other subgenera here, but primarily been trying to review and revise the Evelaeus hemihelictus and Gotagastra fauna for the state. And of course, you can't help but work on um, those species a little more broadly, trying to figure out, is this something that was known from California or um, there's a lot of questions remaining. So again, this is a series of maps for all these species. And the real takeaway is probably just to look at the photo and be like, yeah, that's a tiny little black bee. And to get a sense of the distribution for these species, because it, it gives you a sense of its niche. And so Argemonis, mostly Western Oregon. Robustum, who knows, there's you know, a record out in the seeds. Maybe Montaigne. Some of these things are just rare. Um, Aspilurum, maybe Montaigne. Ocale is a newly documented uh, introduced species from Eurasia, has a super long face, and it's pretty common in the coast range now. Diatridum is a little tiny black thing that's all over the place. Incondidum, as you can see, is really abundant. Colbaris, mostly eastern, so that's kind of cool. This is like a desert, little desert thing. Sequoia, distinctly southwestern. Velociolum is another uh, Eurasian, 
European species, um, early documented, but obviously not newly introduced because it's got a pretty serious distribution um, in the northwest of the state. Probably likes it cool and wet. Aberrans is uh, the old school Protogastra. So these are bees with really large acelli that are specialized on evening primrose. And so they have the large acelli for um, navigating in low light conditions because they're crepuscular foraging on a uh, flower that blooms at dawn and dusk. So that's kind of a cool bee. And anywhere out here on uh, Emathera or evening primrose, especially Emathera and Natalii, you'll probably find a bunch of bees. Um, and there are other bees that are specialized on evening primroses, so that's a really cool target. So, no shortage of Lazy Blossom species. And of course, you end up at the end with some things that you just don't know what they are. <laughs> and so I think Joe's still um, working on trying to figure out um, what these two Spogotogastra might be. Um, do they have historical names? Possibly. Are they new species? Probably. Um, but we don't really know. So everybody wants to answer the question, how many bee species are in the state or in the Northwest or something? And so this question has been uh, tackled before by Stevens, who used to work at OSU in Corvallis. Um, this is a really great resource with a Nomi and Melanderi alkali bee visiting alfalfa on the cover. Um, and Nomi talks about bees generally, and you should read this. Um, he does discuss the Northwestern America fauna. Um, you can see that he provides the map, which is really handy when you're talking about uh, the fauna. Um, but he also includes, as you can see, Northern California, Northern Nevada, Northern Utah, Western Wyoming, um, Idaho, West, Northwestern Montana, and then you know, First Columbia northward. Um, and so that's quite a bit more than just Oregon, really. And so he provides this table. Uh, Jerry, you wanted to see this. <laughs> and so in the first column, we have the genera that he records from the Northwest. There's about 64 genera here. Some of them, of course, don't exist or might exist again. <laughs> but, um, and then, of course, for the request, he just makes an estimate of a species count. And so here you can see Andrina, 200 species. <clears throat> I'm guessing that's a ballpark. <laughs> <laughs> right? So um, if you run through this, you get a sense of the genera that he records from the Northwest. These are mostly genera that I talk about all the time. So we were working on the same fauna. That's good. You can see that he lists 50 Helictus species. And that's because he includes Lazy Blossom in Helictus. He lists 90 Nomada species. Um, and there's some other differences, like Nomadopsis are now a subuse of Calliopsis and things like that. But the takeaway here is that he lists 879 species for the Northwest, including you know, Northern California, Nevada, and so on. But of course, some of those things we won't have. Um, and some of the far northern boreal Arctic things that also occur in his distribution map there we won't have. And so how many do we have? Well, right now we have six families, 55 genera. We have 400 names. And so on that giant network, that included all 400 named bees. Um, but we do have 125 within our genetic data that I haven't even looked at yet because the DNA data came out like 10 days ago. And so I had time to make a tree, but not time to curate all of those additional species. So we can quickly add 125 to our 400 total. And then there are some groups that we haven't treated at all that I can ballpark some figures from, Nomada, and others, and that's around 150 species that have been untouched so far. And so if you add that up, you get 675, or certainly the bee atlas has produced specimens for well over 600 species. And so these are the names to date for those 400. Um, Look away if you have to. <laughs> it's too many bees, man. Um, so it's a lot. And this is, again, like, this is only 400. We have so many more coming and on deck. Um, so what I did was I went through, and I looked at all of our genera, and I made my own estimates the way that Stevens did. 
And so these are the numbers I got. We have the family, we have the genus in parentheses, and then we have my estimate where I wrote down my species estimate for each genus and then added them all up. And so how many is this? Well, we'll figure it out. So what I did was I just added it to his table so that we could compare side by side. You can see that he has far more Andrina. Um, he has far more Nomada. We have way more Lazuglossum or Holictus. And so ultimately, um, what's the answer to the big question of universe, life, and everything? <laughs> but it's um, 782. <laughs> so that's not an unreasonable estimate for our state fauna. I think that'll probably be pretty close eventually. But of course, we know um, many of the species, hundreds of the species, are rare, difficult to find, but we'll get there. I want to say a big thank you to our contributing parataxonomists, uh, Judy, Pat, Jeannie, Ellen, and Ellen, <laughs> um, especially for help with things like Helictus. Um, Helictus makes me feel like Sisyphus, you know, pushing the Helictus up <laughs> the hill for eternity. Um, those are really great um, contributions. Thank you to the Willamette University crew. Um, thank you to August for um, working on the EPO lines. Um, and there are many other people that have contributed, so if I didn't name you and you wanted to be named, my apologies, but Mark has worked on Hylaeus and Hoplitus, uh, Dan curated our Neolera, Mike curated, I don't know, drawers of Perdida and all sorts of stuff, and I'm sure many, we had Merrick curating Atoposmia and all sorts of stuff in the course one time. Um, so there's been all sorts of contributions made by many, many people, and so a lot of this is just all of your work uh, summarized. How are we doing? Uh, 15 minutes. All right, I'll do five minutes of plants and then we'll take questions. Here comes the plants. The biggest thing I want to do is um, just direct you to the rare plant monitoring network. So this is a citizen science project that's being um, run by the Understory Initiative, TUI. Um, they're in the southwest of the state. And this is a project much like ours, but they train volunteers to go out, search for rare plant populations that haven't been visited in a long time, document those populations. And this is an opportunity for some of you to go out um, and document the bees from those rare plants as well. <clears throat> and so that's super cool. And we've been, I know Michael and others have been working on this kind of thing, um, working with Jordan Brown, ODA, rare plant people, to uh, be able to get us to visit some of these sites, which are sometimes kind of hush-hush, um, and collect, uh, you know, generate that kind of interact interaction and network data for these rare plants that can help inform us about them. And so they'll have trainings in the Southwest. They're looking to do uh, work in these national forests, including the Umatilla and Mal here. It's a very ambitious program. I think it has a lot of potential. If we have 782 species of bees in the state, well, there's thousands and thousands of species of plants. I only care about the flowering ones, but there's non-flowering plants that do stuff out there as well. Um, so here's a quick view of some of their priority species for the upcoming field season. And so really quickly here, you can see an Arnica. You can see this really beautiful Colonia Mazama. It's beautiful. There's a a gentian, there's cryptantha that I'm really interested in. We have mariposa lilies and willow herb and native clovers. And a lot of these are host to specialist bees that we already know visit that genus. And so it's likely that in a lot of cases we can find really specialized bees visiting and pollinating these rare plants. And so there's a lot of really cool opportunities here. So you'll want to contact Maggie at the Understory Initiative or Lincoln if you can't remember that or just visit the Understory Initiative uh, website. It's a great organization, and this will be a really cool way for us to get different and important plant data uh, with bees. Hope you gotta re-click me. Dang, okay, it's okay. There we go, okay. Um, so you've probably seen some of these slides before, um, but this provides you with a general phenology for 20 uh, genera or uh, genus groups of plants 
Um, and these are all co mostly common plants um, that host either lots of cool specialist bees, rare bees, or just a lot of different species in general. So things like willow should be on here, number 18. It's a spring blooming plant. Um, it hosts tons of generalists, but also it hosts dozens of bees specialized on willow. Um, and so if you get out there, survey on willow, you're gonna find really cool bees for the atlas. So I was trying to get folks to track these plants down last year, um, but almost no records were generated for them. So we're gonna just quickly get your memory refreshed about um, some of these desert plants that would be great to find bees on, find rare bees, specialist bees, new state records, that kind of thing. So there's a mallow out in the high desert. It looks like an introduced uh, geranium type thing. Uh, but of course, this is going to host like a bunch of weird specialist bees out in the desert. Very cool plant, Malvella. Uh, but you've got to go far and you've got to, you know, track down some of these sites. Another one is the smooth, smooth Menzelia. We don't have any Menzelia specialists known from the state yet, but in the southwest, there's a whole bunch. Perdida, Andrina, and others. And so if you're out in the Hawaii, <laughs> David, <laughs> um, or people from Idaho maybe is more realistic, um, and you, you find some of this, maybe you'll document like some uh, rare berry bee previously known from Nevada, those kinds of situations. These brown eyed primrose are very strange and beautiful. Um, certainly, they host a bunch of specialist bees. This is the same, <laughs> same thing over and over. Cool, rare, specialist, etc. So get out there. Um, Morning Glory has a few different specialist bees on it, especially the native species, and less so the convolvulus, you know, field bindweed, um, those types of um, introduced uh, Eurasian Morning Glories. Um, one of my top targets is still Scarlet Globe Mallow on the east side, all over the place, but especially in the mid, lower Deschutes, the John Day, all over the place, apparently. Um, if you find good patches of this with good activity, go wild, because this is where you're going to find fairy goblin bees and like all sorts of other cool stuff. You know, they're not always uncommon either. Sometimes there's lots of them. Like, here's your fairy goblin bee again. Compliments to John Asher. So this was, this is a new one, and this is one that Judy Maxwell and others have been asking me about. This is vinegar weed, or also known as blue curls, trichostemma. And another recent discovery um, with the help of Brianna and Karen's confirmation was um, a little Melisodes with Velcro tongue, Melisodes sternzi. Um, is specialized on vinegar weed known so far from Siskiyou area, um, but these uh, species of blue curls trichostema are a little more widespread, as you can see, um, in western Oregon. So salvia in the east is a huge target. There's going to be a bunch of specialists on that. People haven't collected on it very much, mostly collected on rosemary, which doesn't count. It's still, <laughs> still good data, uh, but it's, you're not going to find like um, HBDLF salvia on rosemary. Uh, any of the popcorn flowers in dry habitats are a really good target. There are many specialists in the southwest on popcorn flowers, either plagiobotrys like this or on cryptantha. And if you're coming to the SFI field course in late April, we hope to find a whole bunch of those. Um, We've had a great success on the Illinois River surveying on this and finding a whole bunch of new records for the state, many new species records, and some things that we still don't know what they are. Purple Prairie Clover, unfortunately its generic name was changed to Dahlia, but it was previously called Petalistomonas. It just rolls off the tongue really well. It has a bunch of specialist bees. Um, it's undersampled, and if you look, um, it's got some pretty good distributions in like um, central uh, central Deschutes and in the in the John Day. Like these are great hot spots. All of the Cleome, Cleomella, Peritoma, all these stinkweeds um, or spider plants. These are all great targets. They have lots of different specialist bees, of course. So if you can find some uh, Peritoma 
serrata, you're likely to find caliopsis and little zebra striped uh, fairy bees and all sorts of cool stuff on them. Um, we have recently documented a megachile cleome, um, which I believe is specialized on this genus. So we, we have some of the data coming in. And with that, I'd like to thank all of you, but especially um, those that support us financially. Thank you so much. And with that, are there any questions?